What a thrill for us to have Ken Eidelman as our special guest today. I've known Ken Eidelman for over 41 years. We've been friends since uh, way back in 1973. He became the uh, executive vice president at Ozark Christian College when I was a freshman in college there. Uh, we became friends way back then and have become incredible friends over the years. His wife, Kayleen, um, their kids. I knew Kyle Eidelman before he'd ever written a book. I probably knew him before he ever read a book, to be honest. Their daughter, Carissa, and her husband, Brian, got their start here at our church. Uh, Brian was our youth minister and our first worship minister. We just love their whole family. They've been great encouragers to us. Ken, for many years, was the president at uh, Ozark Christian College. He retired from there, took a ministry at Crossroads Christian Church in Evansville, Indiana. Uh, Ken has been one of my accountability partners. There's very few things that I do without running it past him first. He is a dear friend. He's the guy that taught me how to preach. And uh, what a great friend, what a great encourager. And uh, we really are privileged to have him as our guest today. I wanna ask you to give an incredible Crossroads Christian Church welcome to my friend and a uh, great friend of this church, Ken Idom. Thank you. Thank you. As a young man of 16, I was sitting in the audience at a youth rally in Bloomington, Illinois, and the speaker that evening preached from a passage in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, the book of Psalms. Specifically, it was Psalm 119, verses 59 and 60. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Now, for some reason, that Scripture that night became engraved on my mind. You might say it was a moment of truth for me. It was the time that I became fully aware that I needed to take my faith in Jesus Christ more personally and more seriously. It was a time in my life when I was a pretty carefree and a very superficial kid. Basically, I had been living off the vitality of my parents' newfound faith. I was regularly in church, but it was mostly because of their example and because it was at their insistence. It wasn't that I never had a deep thought. It was just that I was more interested in school and sports and family and friends and music and making money. Nothing really bad here. In fact, some of it was good, but I was missing out on the better thing. And at 16, I realized I was missing out on the best thing. So this morning, I want to try to recreate for you the same defining moment that I had as a 16-year-old. Or if you've already experienced it, I want to affirm you on your journey. I want to challenge you this morning to think about your life path, the path you're walking right now. I don't see the average person as being very introspective. I think most people involuntarily resist self-inventory. I think people tend to live life on autopilot. They avoid asking themselves the hard questions about their inner life, questions about who am I and where am I going in life and what am I becoming? Well, this morning, if we can, I want to challenge us all to just kind of push pause and to take time to think about two life paths. In 1968, Charles Murray was a student at the University of Cincinnati. He was a high diver, and he was preparing to compete in the Olympic Games. During his training, he became friends with a fellow student who witnessed to him about Jesus. Not being reared in a Christian home, it was all new to Charles, especially the truth claims in the Bible about sin and his need for God's forgiveness. Well, the day came when his friend put the question to him. She asked him if he was ready to trust Christ as his Savior and Lord, and his verdict was, not now, not yet. 
And in the days following that conversation, Charles avoided that student, but he was also quietly (laughs) considering his ways. Well, because he was in training for the Olympic Games, he had special privileges at the university pool facility. And so late one night, he decided that he would swim and practice some dives. The university pool was housed under a ceiling of glass panes, so he decided not to turn on the lights, but just to allow the moonbeams to illumine the pool area. Charles climbed to the highest platform to take his first dive. As he stood on the platform backwards, he spread his arms to get his balance, and staring at the back wall, he saw his own shadow in the light of the moon. It was the shape of the cross, and in that moment, Charles was overwhelmed by the reality that Jesus died for him, Jesus died in his place, and it broke him. And he sat down on the platform to pray. Suddenly the lights in the pool area came on, and a facility attendant was making rounds to check the building. Charles looked down from the diving platform, and he saw that the pool had been drained for repairs. He would have surely have plummeted to his death, but he decided in a moment of surrender to take a new path for his life and his future, and without even realizing it, Charles Murray literally chose life instead of destruction. He considered his ways. He turned his steps. He did not delay to obey. Well, at the end of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is concluding the Sermon on the Mount, and as He does, He impresses on His listeners that it's decision time. It's time to make a choice. He said, in effect, now that you've heard these things, will you obey them starting today? Will you begin your journey to heaven today? Will you become a loyal and committed follower of mine from this day forward? Look at what he said in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. These are the words of Jesus. Enter the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Well, the lessons we learn from the words of Jesus here are life-changing. They are life-directing. He reveals that there are only two paths, and they're described as broad and narrow, and we're instinctively attracted to the positive implications of a broad road versus the negative implications of a narrow road. But I want you to notice there is no third way. There is no alternate route. If you don't like either of these two options, you can't check the box that says none of the above. There is no box that says none of the above. As Jesus talked about these two life paths, He describes all mankind as being in one of two groups. He never divided people on the basis of nationality or skin color or social standing or education. He divided people only on the basis of the spiritual path they chose to travel. Proverbs 16, 25 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So, There are two paths, only two paths. So think about the implications. That means that there are only two ways to heaven. There is man's way, which is good works, and then there's God's way, being born again. 
Now, man attempts to make himself equal with God, in effect, to be his own God, to be accountable only to himself, to engineer his own way to heaven. And Jesus said, on the day of judgment, many would appeal to him for salvation on the basis of the good works that they had done. And it's a pretty impressive list, prophesying, casting out demons, performing miracles. And so they felt entitled. They felt God owed them heaven on the basis of their good works. But the response of Jesus, I don't know you. I never knew you. Away from me. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam, that's man's way, all die. Even so in Christ, that's God's way, shall all be made alive. Man's way to heaven is through his goodness with no dependence on God. But listen, friends, we don't earn eternal life. We inherit eternal life. When we die to ourselves and live for Jesus Christ, the fact that there are only two paths also means that there are only two ways to happiness, two ways to fulfillment in life. There's man's way, which is give me the world, and there's God's way, give me your life. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a story of a wealthy farmer who had the resume to congratulate himself and the resources to indulge himself, and he did. He was successful in amassing huge profits through his agribusiness. He was wealthy, he was creative, he was enterprising, intending to tear down perfectly good barns just to build bigger ones. He enjoyed financial independence. He enjoyed perpetual R&R. He consumed only the best food and drink. He partied nonstop at the VIP nightclubs. Just one problem, one problem. He was not rich toward God. He considered his life to be his own, to live selfishly as he pleased. And Jesus said that choice made him a fool. Listen, friends, the world will try to seduce you into believing that happiness comes when you drive the luxury car, when you live in the McMansion, when you spend without ever checking the price tag to see how much, when you take the exotic vacations and all the rest. But God's path to happiness and fulfillment is to lose your life. Some might even conclude that you hate your own life simply because you do not share their worldly values. Do you remember what Jesus said in Luke 17, 32? He said, remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. Now, you know Lot's wife was fleeing God's judgment on the materialistic, immoral city of Sodom. But she turned and looked back with longing. And she lost her life because of worldliness. Will we ever learn that the world promises but does not deliver happiness, fulfillment, but rather it delivers disappointment and disillusionment? Where was the fulfillment in Voltaire, the devoted infidel? He wrote, I wish I had never been born. Where was the fulfillment in Lord Byron? He lived life devoted to pleasure. And he wrote, The worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. Where was the fulfillment in millionaire Jay Gould? He wrote, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. Where was the fulfillment in Lord Beaconsfield, an Englishman of rare position and fame? He wrote, youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, old age a regret. Where was the fulfillment in Alexander the Great? He was endowed with historic military glory, but he wept as he lamented, there are no more worlds to conquer. Where then? Where then is fulfillment found? 
The answer is in Jesus Christ alone, who said in John 16, 22, I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Well, two paths also means that there are two ways to build. There's man's way, which is on the sand, and then there's God's way on a rock. Now, Jesus actually spelled this out in His own words right after the passage I just read. Beginning in verse 24 of Matthew 27, it says that if you hear and obey the words of Jesus, you're like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. But if you hear the words of Jesus and disobey them or disregard them or devalue them, you're like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And when the rains come, and they will, and the streams rise and the winds blow and beat against the house built on the rock, it will stand while the house built on the sand will collapse. The fact that there are only two paths also means that there are only two ways to die. There's man's way to die alone, and there's God's way to die in the Lord. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus discloses the biographies of two men, a rich man whose name we're never told, and a man named Lazarus who was a poor beggar. One man lived his life for himself. The other man lived a life of deprivation, completely dependent on the Lord and the benevolence of compassionate people. And the rich man was not one of those. But at their deaths, everything was inverted. The rich man was in torment. Lazarus was in paradise. And it's a graphic illustration of the fact that we will die in one of two ways, either alone or in the Lord. These two ways to die, these two ways to build our lives, these two ways to happiness and fulfillment, these two ways to heaven ultimately present us with the choice of only two paths that we can walk in our journey through life, the broad way or the narrow way. There are two paths, but there are also only two gates. They're described by Jesus in our passage as wide and narrow. Now, I suppose if you're going to enter the wide gate, well, you can bring along whatever you want. There is no limit to the amount of baggage you can carry. You don't have to leave anything behind. Your bad habits, your addictions, your grudges, your bad attitudes, your prejudices, especially your secret sins. But in contrast, Jesus said finding the narrow gate requires a search. You have to look for it, and you have to be alert to find it. And then you're, you discover that you are the only thing that will fit through that narrow gate. To enter it, you have to leave everything behind. It's just big enough for you and nothing else. No baggage. Just you. On April 26, 2003, Aaron Ralston, a 27-year-old mountaineer and outdoorsman, set out on a day of adventure without telling anyone where he was going. While climbing, he dislodged an 800-pound rock that trapped his right hand against the canyon wall. And for the next 127 hours, a little over five days, he was literally trapped between a rock and a hard place, and that became the title for his book. He wrote about the experience between a rock and a hard place. Finally, Aaron says that he had a conversation with himself out loud in that canyon. You're going to have to cut your arm off, Aaron. I don't want to cut my arm off. Dude, you're going to have to cut your arm off or you'll die. And you know the rest of the story. He did it. He amputated his own arm with a rusty pocket knife and no anesthetic. 
And here's the application. Your spiritual life may depend on making sacrifices to get through the narrow gate in order to get your feet on the narrow path that leads to life. So, what might you have to amputate? Cut off. What might you have to excise? Cut out of your life today in order to truly follow Jesus. Well, moving on, consider this too. Jesus said there are only two crowds, only two crowds, and Jesus talks about the many and the few. Many have entered the wide gate and are walking on the broad way, and only a few have entered the small gate and are walking in the narrow way. Now, few here does not mean that there are not going to be lots of people in heaven. <laughs> Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 talks about a multitude that no one can count. Few means that as you journey through this life, if you choose the narrow path, sometimes you're going to feel alone on the job, in your classroom, in your family gatherings. The narrow way can feel like a lonely road at social functions. And this is why our devotion and discipline to be faithful in church matters. Because you can come here and look around and see over 5,000 worshipers assembled and you will leave encouraged. But I'll tell you, if you're more into watching the drunken crowd bumping and grinding on the beach at Daytona during spring break on MTV, it can be pretty demoralizing to you as a Christian. I think more high school graduates need to experience Bible college, Christian college, not only to ground them in a literate and strong faith, but so they can also experience that encouraging socialization that comes from being in community with hundreds of other committed Christian young people. And I commend this church for your conscience about that. You are propelling many of these young people that were on this platform in this service and in the earlier service will wind up being Christian leaders in the future because of your Bible college partnership. Danny Warfel was an outstanding quarterback at the University of Florida. He was actually a Heisman Trophy winner. Later played professionally for the Chicago Bears. But in 1995, while he was still playing college ball, Playboy magazine announced its intent to name Warfel as the quarterback of its All-American team. Warfel politely refused. Reflecting later, he said, it was something I didn't want to be a part of because of my beliefs and because of the way I live my life. He said, many are on the wide road, not me. I've chosen a different path. So you've got to decide what crowd you want to identify with in choosing your life path. Jesus said there are only two paths, two gates, two crowds, and finally, there are only two destinations. And throughout Scripture, we see the presentation of choice between two destinations. Moses acted as a spokesman for Jehovah, announcing to the Israelite nation in Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, verse 19, see, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction, blessings and curses. Now, choose life so that you and your children may live. Psalm 1 contrasts the way of sinners with the way of the righteous and their respective endings. It says the way of the wicked will perish. But it says about the righteous, he or she will be like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. 
There's a tombstone in a churchyard in Yorkshire, England, with this inscription. Remember, friend, when passing by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, soon you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. <laughs> Underneath, someone had hand-printed, to follow you I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the rock group ACDC was never shy about which of the two roads they had chosen. Their signature song in 1979 was an anthem called Highway to Hell, still played on rock music stations today. Listen to the description of ACDC about the wide road. Don't need no reason, don't need no rhyme. Ain't nothing I'd rather do. Going down, party time. My friend's going to be there too. No stop signs, no speed limit. Nobody's going to slow me down. Look at me. I'm on the way to the promised land. I'm on the highway to hell. Well, in contrast, the journey to heaven begins with the right choice at the place where the road forks in front of us, poet Robert Frost talks about it in his poem, The Road Not Taken. He said, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere in ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So, you and I stand at the crossroads, and we make our choice of paths. We make our choice of gates. We make our choice of crowds. We make our choice of destinations. And I know this morning that some of you are here today, and you've been looking for this fork in the road. You know you need something different. The road you've traveled has not taken you to where you want to go. You have been seeking the road to forgiveness and new life. And you can lay hold of it today. Some of you here today are learning for the first time about this intersection. You weren't looking for it. But since you've heard about it, it's a welcome surprise. And <laughs> you're ready to take the narrow road that leads to life. And there are probably some here today who are stuck in traffic. You think your life is too cluttered right now to even think about it. You're hemmed in by others who are going down the broad way that leads to destruction. In your better moments, you want to get on the narrow road. So maybe this can be one of those better moments. Let me tell you what you have to do. You have to put on your blinker, and you have to cut across the two or three lanes of traffic that separate you from that exit. And you may make some people mad that you cut in front of them. But you cut across, the, across that traffic and get on the narrow way that leads to life. And some will see it and put on their blinker and follow. And some of you have had an accident or you're close to breaking down, running out of gas. Maybe it's a serious illness. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's relational problems in the family. Maybe it's financial struggles. Regardless of how you got to this crossroads, how many more times will you come to this decision point? How many more times will you be in a worship service where you are prompted, encouraged by God's Spirit to get off the broad way, to forsake the broad way, and get your feet on the narrow way that leads to life? Today, consider your ways. Turn your steps to the Lord. Hasten and do not delay. Make this your hour of decision, your moment of truth. Will you stand with me for prayer?